So, oh, ladies and gentlemen, we're we'll going to be starting for pneumonia uh, today. Now, unfortunately, I did not uh, have. Huh? Who am I? I'm Dr. Khan. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> uh, the name is uh, on the lecture. But uh, <laughs> there was not as much fun pictures as there were last time. No. So, this is going to be actually educational. Uh, but we'll get ahead and get started and talk about what is pneumonia. Okay, now there's a lot of reading over here, but really the picture is what matters because it's an inflammation of the parenchyma of the lung. And what is a parenchyma? It's a big complicated thing for the lining of the air sacs, okay? And what you have is you have some fluid accumulation happening. And that is the problem, the basic problem of what is happening in pneumonias, okay? Now, most cases are caused by microorganisms, okay? But there are some non-infectious causes, aspiration of food, gastric acid, foreign bodies, uh, hydrocarbons and lipoids, you know, that's a rare thing. Substances, which you get hypersensitivity to. Reactions from drugs or radiation, and as well as some induced pneumonitis. So, there are a few ways to classify pneumonias, okay? Now, the first one we're going to talk about is going to be anatomical classifications. You're going to have a low bar pneumonia. So, that is a consolidation or fluid buildup in all or part of a single lobe. Then, you'll also have a bronchopneumonia, the consolidation in scattered lobules all over, not specifically within one lobe and not even all adjacent to each other. And then you'll have one that's really fun, it's an interstitial pneumonia. This is typically viral, there's an inflammatory process that's going on, a little bit of an overreaction from your body's part, uh, and you'll have infiltrate mainly between the tissue of the alveoli. And then we're going to have the ones that are fun that we care about the most, these are the clinical classifications because this is what we deal with the most. You're going to have community acquired pneumonias. Those are typical, atypical, and aspiration. You're gonna have pneumonias in the elderly, because they have a little bit different issue. You'll have your nosocomial, or hospital, or healthcare, sorry, acquired pneumonias. I've grouped that into hospital acquired, healthcare associated, and ventilator associated. And then you're gonna have pneumonias in immunocompromised folk. Those are also treated a little bit differently in the clinical sense. Now the community acquired pneumonia, what is that? Okay, so that is an infection of the pulmonary parenchyma, because it's a pneumonia. It's associated with symptoms of an infection. You're gonna have infiltrate, you're gonna have auscultary findings, and on the chest x-ray, you're gonna see some, something that's not right. Uh, we'll talk about the not right parts later in the lecture. But more importantly, the thing is, is what causes it? So, what counts, sorry, as community-acquired pneumonia? You can't be within a building, okay? Any medical building for about 90 days, okay? This includes dialysis, LTAC, things of that sort, except for outpatient clinics. That doesn't count as a healthcare building. Uh, or you've been in the hospital. How about assisted living? For, so that does not count as a healthcare facility. Okay, that's curious. Prison? We'll talk about those in a little bit. <laughs> but uh, that has some, you, you, usually that gets grouped under immunocompromised situations. Yeah. But, one last thing. Oh yes, if you're in the hospital, you get in, you get a pneumonia within less than 48 hours, that's also community acquired. Okay, and there's a little flow chart I'll hand out later that we'll talk about those. And here is the hospital acquired pneumonia. So it occurs 48 hours after admission. And they didn't find it, and at the time of admission, they didn't have symptoms of it. And the symptoms are generally fever and cough. That's when you're going to start thinking, all right, this might be pneumonia. Okay, that's the clinical symptoms of it. Now, this is going to happen to somebody who's been in an acute care hospital for two more days within 90 days of an infection. They've been in a nursing home or long-term care facility, that counts, but assisted living does not. Or if they received outpatient infusion, antibiotics, chemotherapy, wound care within 30 days, that I'm not sure how much is gonna get tested on, but that is out there for people to know, okay? Or if they've been in a hospital or hemodialysis clinic. Now important to note, this does not include employees, this is about patients. So you can work at some of these places, you can get them. That's we, we don't always have hospital acquired pneumonia or healthcare acquired pneumonia. We can, we're in the community. The main reasoning is that is that when you stay in the hospital for extended amount of times, that is when your normal flora will start changing. Why wouldn't the wound care be under immunocompromised? So, because those people usually are like the diabetics people and all that. You make a good point. And I did not think about that when I was uh, quickly just writing this down. But maybe maybe there's like crossover and stuff. Because I mean, like, are they talking about wound care at like a wound clinic? So you, yeah, yeah, this is when you go to a wound care facility for treatment. Yeah. So usually those people are like, you know, I don't know. I, that, 
maybe, but that's kind of a stretch. Not everybody with uh, who needs yeah. to go wound clinic is a severe PAD. Oh, but I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. That, that, that might uh, cross over into the like immunocompromised curious. treatment scenario. Then we have the fun one that I like is a ventilator associated pneumonia because we do this to people. Uh, and it gets you pneumonia that's 48, 72 hours after an endotracheal intubation. Doesn't matter how good you are, you're going to make give these to people. Okay? And then we're going to have atypical. So what, what does it mean atypical? All right, because, you know, we just throw these words out. We don't actually know what they mean. But it's it's not hard hitting. Pneumonia is a, you know, you're sick. It's atypical because you're not really all that sick. It's a subacute onset. Your fever is either an absent or not as intense that it'll be an irregular pneumonia. And you're also going to be having not too much sputum production in this, which really clues you in that, yeah, there's something going on in the lung layer instead of in the larynx or pharynx area. Now, microbiologically, you're not going to see anything really too bad, OK? Gram stains negative. Cultures aren't going to be good. You're not going to find anything. Radiologically, you're going to have either an interstitial pattern or you're going to have patchy filtrates. That's another kind of the atypical scenario. Um, and then a hemogram, which is a fun thing, you're going to see peripheral leukocytosis that is not as big as in a regular pneumonia. Now, yeah. what, how does pneumonia develop? Okay, so what's happening is that you're going to have, usually you don't know, because it's hard to culture, it's hard to get good tissue, because that's invasive, you can't really get, everybody doesn't want to get bronchoscope, you know, evidently it's not as fun as it sounds. Uh, and usually also the cultures are just bad. Okay, they're not going to be deep sputum. It's going to be really from your mouth. They're just going to like, you know, spit like old cowboys. You're not getting good samples here. Okay, it's bad science. So what happens? Okay, now the most common things that we're worried about because we can do something about it are bacterial causes of pneumonia. Are you going to talk about the different grouping of the cultures or no? Uh, that is later, <laughs> but not too much, probably. Okay. I'm just curious. Okay. <laughs> Bacterial is most common, so we got a lot of different causes, okay? And I wrote more than what is in the handout. The handout is the thing that is, there's a one sheet you need to take a look at to answer questions on it for board exams, okay? I tried to cut it down even more. It's actually pretty cluttered, but you know, you'll have to deal with it. <laughs> the most common, the most common is strep pneumo, okay? Streptococcus pneumonia, that's the most common bacterial cause of pneumonia, okay? Then you're gonna have group B strep, you're gonna have group A strep, or gas, as I like to call it. Uh, and then you're going to have mycoplasma pneumonia. You're going to have chlamydia pneumonia that happens most commonly actually in adolescents. Okay? Then you're going to have chlamydia trachomatis that also happens in infants. It's usually something that happens when uh, during the, the birth process, so they're really young neonates that are going to have that situation. Uh, then you're going to have mixed anaerobes that happens mostly in aspiration pneumonias, especially in folk that are known to have alcohol abuse or they have dementia. And long story short, their consciousness is not normal. They're going to start aspirating, and then rarely you'll have some gram-negative enterics. That's uh, not too fun. Usually you have some other stuff in there too, like stomach acid and such. Uncommon causes. You're going to actually have H flu. So that will happen in immunocompromised people, or sorry, unimmunized people from H influenza. And also, you're also going to have Staph aureus. You're going to have Moraxella cateralis, Neisseria meningitidis, pneumonia. That nah, can happen. Then you have some fun ones, okay? This is, again, weird stuff. Maybe they'll ask you on it. I doubt it. Francerella tolerensis, when you have animal or fly contact, okay? They start giving you, like, rabbits or something funny like that. When you're going rabbit hunting, Tolerant. it was Francis, okay? That's his, it's his fault. Huh? Elmer Fudd. Yeah, he might have this. <laughs> uh, then you have Nocardia species. That's going to happen in immunosuppressed people, okay? So they're not immunocompromised, but you're suppressing them from drug or something. Uh, you're going to have chlamydia pistachii, which is a bird contact, okay? They are a parrot keeper, a zoo keeper, something of that sort. That's the one that they're going to get. That's come up for me before. Okay. So definitely remember that so one. So remember that one. Then you're going to have a fun birds. one. It is called Yersinia pestis, okay? Or the Black Plague. I want you to know currently, this is a fun fact, uh, current uh, Madagascar is having an outbreak at the moment. I thought so they said Texas had some too, Nick. They might yeah. be getting it. You know, some, some folk went to Madagascar for a safari or something. They might have got it. Yeah, they were saying it back. that the, the plague is coming back in like. Uh, and I was like, excuse me? Yeah, and this, this is the plague. I want everybody to know this is the black plague, the bubonic plague. That is it. Now, the last one on this side is actually Legionella species. So that's a common one that we test for over here uh, in, in the atypical sense. That happens when you're exposed to contaminated water. 
as we standing water, you have to be exposed to it for a duration of time. Okay, certain amount of people, certain kind of workers get it. Okay, people that work on vent systems, AC systems, people that go to places that are going to be a lot of standing water, hot tubs, cruises, things of that nature. Did so, you find out why that guy had it? Our patient couldn't, didn't couldn't, couldn't figure it out. No, okay. we didn't. No exposure to ponds, anything. It was weird. As far as you know, maybe he's got a little yeah, kitty pool yeah. in his house. Oh, or could God it be no. the AC? Or the it's, AC? It could be the AC too, but usually you got to be really up in there. Okay, again, Maybe it's within the realm of possibility. Now, here are the things that the patients hate to hear about, all right? The viral cause of pneumonia, because you know what we do about them? Nothing. Nada. Nada. That's exactly right. Uh, the most common causes we're going to have right over here on this side, you can go to that one for now. Uh, respiratory syncytial virus, I don't know how to pronounce RSV. that, RSV. Okay, uh, you got parainfluenza, there's three types, I learned about that. Uh, no idea if that's useful to any of you guys. Uh, you got influenzas A and B, that's commonly tested, and that's just commonly available in the environment. You have adenovirus, another common thing, usually summertime, okay? Uh, then you have another one called metanumovirus, I never heard of before, but it's common, so that's the thing. I don't have uh, any tests for it or PCRs, so we don't think it exists, <laughs> according to the hospital. Huh? You test for human is it? Yeah. I have not heard of that before. We don't deal with kiddos, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's uh, probably a good thing to, to keep in mind then. Okay, kids get it and we can test for it? Yeah. What, what is the test name? Human metanumovirus. Then I didn't spell it right. Because <laughs> I couldn't find it. We probably know. It, no, if probably it is here, it's probably a send out. And you have to do like that side thing where you could say like special lab. And like you could send it. Oh, and the boss has to approve it? Maybe merge in a viral panel too. Some places have it as part of their, if you do a viral swab, all, all the things in one swab? All right, we'll just, yeah. we'll just order that, the viral panel. <laughs> now onto the uncommon ones. These are more fun, probably will get tested on, because there's certain groups that get it. Rhinovirus, okay, that's just up in here. It's really not a pneumonia-type symptom, but sometimes they'll have cough because of post-nasal drip, and that's when you're, that'll light up your senses of this might be pneumonia. It's not really pneumonia. Uh, you're going to have enterovitis a virus. It happens in babies. And again, they don't swallow good. Okay, that's the problem here. That's when I get this. Then herpes simplex. Once again, unfortunately, it's the little kids that get this. This is usually going to be a birth canal process. If they have a flare up during birth, vaginal birth, that's when they'll get this. And again, they don't swallow good. So they just eat everything. Cytomegalovirus. Now, this happens often in immunosuppressed peoples. Uh, if they have measles, Varicella, hantavirus, or the SARS agent, which I'm not sure what that is. SARS is the one that was in uh, China. Sudden acute. Oh, sudden acute respiratory, respiratory syndrome? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So if they have the that one. Hantavirus is the one with the. Um, with rabbits or something? No, for, uh, bats? Bats. I think it's bats. Bats, bats in like the northeast the area, right? Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's rat food. Hantavirus is rat, rat poop. Mm -hmm. All right, rat, rat poop. mice. Rat and mice. They will co commitly have cytomegalovirus because there's some synergy that's going on there. They have, you know, a corporate murder deal going on. Uh, but then we're going to go on to the funky causes. All right, fungal stuff. This is definitely testable because there's like a weird thing that people do that makes it happen. Histoplasma capsulatum, bird or bat contact, or in particular, they're in the Ohio River Valley. So anybody goes down south, relatives or anything of that sort. Think about this one, okay? It's a rough thing. It causes some extra pulmonary disease as well that can last for a long time. And you're going to have cryptococcus, okay? It's going to have bird contact again. They're out there bird watching or hunting or whatever it is folks do with birds. And there's a specific area they go to. Where is it? Uh, for cryptococcus, oh, in the western desert regions, I believe. Yeah, San Joaquin. Yeah, yeah some, oh. one, of those, one of those river valleys. I forgot that dude talked about it, didn't he? <laughs> uh, the oh, aspergillus. Oh, is that that one? Yeah. Okay, so aspergillus also happens. Sorry, say again? No, I said San Juan Valley. That's the San Joaquin Valley? Yeah, you said it. Yeah, San yeah. San that's how you say it. No, no, no. They that, said that's how you really San Joaquin, say it. San Joaquin, whatever like that, that place is, it's cactoid. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> uh, but then you're always going to have aspergillus happening. This is going to happen in immunosuppressed people because usually our body can handle fung fungus uh, illnesses. We don't deal with it. You're going to have a different kind of picture on the x-ray, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, another one is mucomycosis, really rather vile 
Immunosuppressed people have it. Then you have coccidioides and amitis. That's the one that's also with uh, cryptococcus, same place? No, different place. So coccidioides is San Joaquin, <laughs> and then cryptococcus is somewhere else. Which oh, that's a different place. Know. Okay, there we go. Then you have blastomycosis. That's another uh, Ohio River Valley situation. Mississippi, Mississippi River Valley? The, the Mississippi and the Ohio River are in like state overlap. They overlap? Okay. okay. Yeah. You're going to have that one. Now, here's a really fun one for Ketzial illnesses. So this is going to be people that are really fooling around with uh, goat, sheep, or cattle. You know, they 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 up in business where they really shouldn't be. Uh, that's for Ketzial or Ketzia, and you give one of my favorite medicines, doxycycline, for it. You and the doxy, man. <laughs> and here are some more funky causes. Again, a big list. I'm sorry, guys. You don't have to know all of these on my chart. Okay, this is weird, wacky stuff, again, for board questions. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, all right? That's happening in undeveloped countries. We all have to get tested for it, and also it's uh, healthcare people get it. Bad stuff, don't get TB. It sucks. Uh, but then another one that's fun is Mycobacterium avium intracellulare, which is another bird-associated illness. Okay, these birds, you know, that to get us. <laughs> Immunosuppressed people, in particular, AIDS folks with a certain uh, CD, CD count less than, less than 50. You got a prophylax for that. And think about it when they have that problem. And the prophylaxis is bad. Bactrum, bactrum, okay. indeed. Uh, we'll talk about that. And then you have the parasites. Okay, you know these are you know things you don't want in you. Think alien, it's bad. Uh, you're gonna have pneumocystis carini and other immunosuppressed it's people. Me. Also, people getting steroids. Okay, they can get this situation. A lot of people on long-term steroids over here in our community. We don't actually think about it that much. I think, at least I don't, until I read this. Uh, then you're going to have eosinophilic. And PJP is the one that you do for um, HIV patients with the CD4 count less than 100. And you prophylax it with azithromycin? Is that the one? I thought 200 is for PCP. Is it? Okay. And 100 is for toxoplasma. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll right. talk I about that in a little bit. Uh, then you have another fun thing Loeffler syndrome. Likely not to get tested on. I just put it on there. Uh, but now we have the fun things, okay? You're gonna have non-infectious causes, all right? One is gonna be aspiration of food, most common thing that happens, okay? People out there drinking too much, they try to you know, have some nice greasy fries or wings or whatever, goes down the wrong pipe, pretty common. But what we don't think about is, folks with dementia, it is literally a neurological problem, okay? So not just forgetting like you know, their names or where they are, or things of that nature, or the names of the kids, their muscles are forgetting how to work. So they will literally forget how to swallow, and they will commonly aspirate, okay? There's no telling when it'll happen, what stage of dementia. It is a neurological breakdown illness. So this is the thing that I don't really think about too much, is when, oh, hey, all you guys that dementia has got pneumonia? Community acquired, probably, okay? That's one thing I don't think we think of. Gastric acid will end up in there. It's gonna be, again, this is mostly we're gonna be with ethanol people. They're gonna be vomiting, but then they're not gonna, like, get rid of it properly. It'll come down in. Foreign bodies, that's usually a kiddo problem, okay? They like putting everything in their mouth because that's how they interact with the world. That's uh, their newest sense that they found out is cool. Um, but things go down the wrong pipe, okay? Typically, you're not going to have an infectious problem that they're having. But once in a while, somebody doesn't notice it and they just, you know, breathing funny for a too long time. You have a blocked pipe, and anytime you have a blockage, pneumonia, uh, infection is going to build up. In this case, it's going to be pneumonia. Uh, then you have hydrocarbons, which is fun stuff, okay? Certain fumes of things that we like to use, such as kerosene, will build up and get trapped in your lungs, okay? Because they just, they're very uh, sticky, for lack of a better term, to your lung parenchyma. And again, they're going to block some of these alveoli. You, you inhale enough of it, it'll coalesce and form a... A little bit of a, a plug, if you will, like a mucus plug, but uh, it's just going to trap. You know, think of it like an air embolus. Okay, and it's just stuck in there. Then you're gonna have lipoid mm -hmm. substances, again, similar to the hypercarbon. Aspiration of amniotic fluid, rather rare, again, where I am, but board exams are real, keep that in mind. And then the other stuff is uh, aspiration of injected materials like silicone. And now, here's the table. If you wanna take a picture or, you know, ask me to email you the slide, this is probably gonna be the one, because they often wanna ask you, what's the most common things that are in certain age groups? Now, this is the ones that we actually, are gonna care about in like life, okay? Five to 18 year olds and 18s and above, uh, essentially the same, okay? So once you're five and above, you're an adult when it comes to your lungs flora, okay? But the, the important things, kiddos, neonates less than one month, you're gonna have group B strep, okay, or E. coli, 
that's probably the more common thing, but then you're also gonna have strep pneumo, H influenza, that can happen in them. Uh, one to three month febrile pneumonias, in particular, is gonna be mostly viral. RSV, influenza, parent influenza, ado adenovirus, they said it was mo actually more common in that group, okay? The reason RSV I put up there is because you're gonna do something about it in terms of uh, hospitalization, contact, respiratory precautions, okay, for, for kids. But bacterial causes are strep pneumonia and H influenza in febrile one to three month babies. Non, or afebrile, you're gonna have chlamydia trachomatis. So they're gonna have symptoms, but without fevers. Uh, mycoplasma hominis and cytomegalovirus. Three to 12 months, again, RSV, big things. You guys took a picture if you care. If not, I can email it later. Now, this is a picture I just wanna put in there for you know mental break, I couldn't get as many. But um, a buddy of mine, we went uh, hiking and he took this picture. It doesn't blow up as good, but that's pretty what we sweet. got. Pretty sweet, yeah. So, it's not pick. a stock photo. It's, really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a real photo. Uh, unfortunately, we have to get back to business. And that's a hospitalization of kids with pneumonia. <laughs> Again, I was trying to you know keep things in for board exam and it's gonna happen if they're less than six months. Almost essentially, they got pneumonia, less than six months, we're keeping them. Okay, that's the deal. Uh, or if they have sickle cell with acute chest syndrome. Okay, this is gonna happen in populations that you either suspect or know that they have sickle cell. Multi-lobe involvement, something else going wrong, wanna make sure that they can properly respirate and if they need to be, they'll go into the neonatal ICU for that situation. Im immunocompromised children. Any kid less than 18, immunocompromised or keeping them. That's the deal. Toxic appearance, again, sepsis, uh, severe respiratory distress. Uh, kids got small airways. They don't have a lot of compensation room. We're gonna definitely keep them. If for whatever reason, they have supplemental oxygen requirement, okay? That counts in my head as respiratory distress, okay? We're gonna be keeping them. They look dehydrated. They, they're vomiting uncontrollably, even though the main symptom was cough. Okay. But can't adenovirus, is it, is it adenovirus or RSV that can have the gastric symptoms in children? Adeno? Adeno. Adenovirus? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's why they're talking about it. That might be the case. I'm going to keep Well, and if, if you have an adeno kid, they can get tachypnic. So if they're tachypnic and vomiting, then you increase their risk for them in aspiration pneumonia. Okay. Anytime you have these kids and their respiratory rate is so fast, you have to, they're not allowed to eat. Okay. You, don't, you want to be careful about them vomiting. So it's like an adult. Like if yeah. I had an adult that was a respiratory rate of 33, I wouldn't let them eat either. That's fair. We'll keep that in mind. Again, there's no response to oral antibiotics, okay? You give them a little bit and they're not getting better right away. I'm, the antibiotics, we give them for long days because you want to make sure it doesn't recur. But it stops working pretty quick. So it's it's, viral, though. that's true. That's true. Non-compliant parent. That's a common thing we don't think about. Because we don't actually. We don't deal with them, but it's an important case. So that's when we're gonna start hospitalizing people for social reasons. We do that a lot anyway. This is, I suppose, you're just saying the guardian is non-compliant. Uh, then here's something to think about when you're gonna have recurrent pneumonias, okay? It's gonna be for any reason, you gotta start thinking outside the box. People don't just get pneumonia. It's not actually a common illness, even though everyone in the hospital has it. Um, cystic fibrosis, it's a very common uh, genetic disorder that causes people to have recurrent pneumonias. Very dangerous as well, it's a mandatory uh, testing for in children now, okay? But that doesn't mean that people can't come from a place that uh, they immigrated after they were born, young age, they never got tested, okay? Or sometimes they're so old that they got and they didn't get tested. But that's unlikely because cystic fibrosis kills. Yeah, so that's so that's 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 within the realm of possibility. It's rather unlikely. Okay, or you just got people who are visiting from some country. Okay, some three, four-year-old kiddo. You know, like hey, you know, they got sick when they're here. But they didn't get tested for it. Okay, less common cause is other places test for it with certain genetic groups. They're not one of the common ones, and they can get it. There's actually many genetic mark causes that eventually oh, lead to fibrosis, cystic fibrosis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is sickle cell syndrome, okay? This is also gonna cause, long story short, destruction of the alveolar uh, flow tracks. You're gonna have problem with moving air and getting more plugging. So you're gonna have recurrent pneumonia in that case. 
then you're going to have the fun stuff that we talked about a little bit earlier is the disorders of the leukocytes, okay? Chronic granulomatous disease, hyperimmunoglobulin E syndrome, uh, and leukocyte adhesion defects, okay? Because most of these things have to do with your mucous membranes and how they deal with foreign antigens. Your lungs, their whole job is to take the outside environment, put them inside, and kick them out as fast as possible. They're supposed to have pretty good border patrol, but people with this illnesses, Border Patrol, you know, more like the Canadian border than the Mexican one these days. Okay. Then again, you're going to have the serious disorders of immunity. Uh, AIDS, Bruton's A globulinemia, can't say that one all the way. Selective Ig subclass deficiencies, common variable immunodeficiency syndromes, and severe common immunodeficiency syndromes. They all kind of present similar, uh, except for <coughs> common and AIDS, which happens in older people, Bruton's, selective IgG, and severe combined, they're going to be kids that end up with this disease. So for us, not going to see it too much, but again, on tests, they love asking those kind of questions. And you got to start thinking about those. Back to more some more recurrent pneumonias, you're going to have disorders of cilia. There's going to be immotile cilia syndrome or Cartagner syndrome. Then you're going to have the more obvious anatomic disorders. Again, this is kiddos. Uh, sequestration, lobar emphysema, esophageal reflux, foreign body, again, kids, uh, tracheoesophageal fistula, gastro, GERD is the one that happens in adults that we see that they're going to have recurrent pneumonias. And really, it kind of shows up as a nocturnal asthma as well. And you're going to have bronchiectasis and aspiration due to oropharyngeal incoordination which is the official thing of when the de with dementia folk can't do the swallowing. Uh, and okay, back down to the more basic stuff that's just general learning. What's happening in pneumonia? It's a lower respiratory effect it, it, uh, that's normally sterile and they got physiologic de defenses. They have cilia that are moving stuff out so nothing's really staying there long enough to make a problem. Uh, and you got secretion of IgA. You, you can cough stuff up if you know it gets a little bit irritated in some place, you know kick stuff out right away. Uh, and you got basically very good clearance of any kind of substance that's not supposed to be there. Okay, That's the normal thing that's going on. But then for us is you're going to get buildup of fluid for whatever reason. Okay, And that's not something that we're supposed to be able to get out properly because the lungs deal with air, not fluid. Fluid gets trapped goes back down in gravity, you just, you know, you're standing all day, you're doing work, that's enough time for something to start catching on and building up. Okay, so the main problems that you're going to have, you're going to have high fevers and chills. Okay, that's what they look like when they're going to be coming in. They're going to have headaches, loss of appetite, and more importantly, mood swings. Okay, these are all central nervous system effects. Uh, you're going to have clamminess and blueness in the skin because clamminess, again, part of the fever thing, but blueness because remember, they're not oxygenating properly in some portions. So that's going to be the other thing. Septic. Indeed. Uh, you're going to have, again, high heart rate. You're going to have nausea, vomiting. You're going to have joint pain as well, muscular fatigue. Long story. This guy, he's got all of them. He's septic. All right, he's got a problem. But the most important thing is you're going to have pleuritic chest pain. It's also you're going creepy. To cough. <laughs> and you're going to have some shortness of breath. Uh, I don't know. I think he has got some good musculature on him. <laughs> I have <laughs> Uh, but now we're going to talk about some of the different ways that the infections cause illness. So that way you can kind of try to figure out, is it viral, is it bacterial? There's a lot of overlap in this, but uh, people from the third world are very adept at clinical diagnoses, because that's what they do, okay? They got, they got a single plane film, they got the story, and they have their ears. And that's how they figure out what this is. So you're going to have this. This is going to be an infection along the entire airway. It's going to be direct injury to the respiratory epithelium. Virus, you know, they secrete nasty stuff. They're destroying cells. Something of that thing is happening. But then you're going to have an abnormal airway obstruction because of cytokine response. Okay, Swelling happens. Cellular debris builds up. And this is going to very typically happen in small caliber airways. Okay, For adults, when it gets to the ends, that's where it'll be. Again, remember that whole idea of the patchy infiltrate because it got to the ends of everything. Okay, But also in kiddos because they've just got small airways all around. And this can make them, the kids, having viral severe respiratory infections. So that's another thing that we try to watch for them very carefully. Uh, but then here's the other problem. 
viral <laughs> infection, again, it's disrupting the border patrol, so this makes you susceptible to a secondary bacterial infection. So this is the thing that we're usually worried about when they're in a the hospital setting, and they've been here for a long time, too. If they've got some core morbidities, anything of those, that thing happening, we usually don't want to mess around with those kind of symptoms. Uh, so, again, it's disturbing the normal response, it's disturbing the bacterial flora, you're getting pretty messed up. Now, in bacterial infection, this varies depending on the organism, okay? Not sure how good this is going to be for exams, but for clinical practice, if you can try to figure this stuff out, this would be great instead of just giving everybody vanxosin, okay? <laughs> Mycoplasmonia. This is going to attach itself to the respiratory epithelium. It's going to inhibit the cilia from doing its job. They're just not going to start moving properly. So you're going to have some buildup of uh, fluid. You're going to have inflammatory response to the submucosa. And you're going to have just a lot of mucosal plugging going on. Okay, you're going to, they're going to feel, they're going to start coughing. They'll be like, oh, I feel really bad. <coughs> oh, I'm actually pretty good now. All right, and that's what, how myconeplasma shows up. Again, that's the walking pneumonia. Okay, so they're like, they're kind of good, they're kind of bad, but they just keep on trucking. And that's what's going on in that one, because you're going to have problems along the entire bronchial tree, like a viral pneumonia, but perhaps not all as like diffuse as the viral pneumonia is going to be. Now, the more common thing is strep pneumonia, and this is going to be a local edema, because the body's pretty good at reacting to it, so it just overreacts. All right, wherever it starts growing, pump cytokines, immune response, everything is going in there. And you're going to have proliferation of that organism, usually in one part of the lung lobar, if you will. Uh, and you're going to be able to clearly see that on a chest x-ray. Now, the group A strep, or the gas, this is going to be a little bit nasty, okay, because it starts necrosing tissue, and it makes gas because things are getting destroyed. Uh, you're going to have a large amount of exudate and demena, uh, edema as well as some local hemorrhage. So you might have a little bit of a colored sputum coming up in that. And this is going to go into the intraalveolar septa. It's going to go into the lymph nodes. This one might end up getting somebody septic pretty good. Staph aureus, another bad one, produces toxins and hemolysin as well. So this is just going to start ruining your day pretty fast. And they've, again, we talked about a little bit earlier with the uh, cellulitis. It's got staphylokinase as well as coagulase, and it's going to cause hemorrhagic necrosis. These are very aggressive pneumonias. We okay. had a guy last year where it actually went through the chest wall. Oh, wow. We had that guy, and then we had the other guy with the MRSA pneumonia who was on the vent and by level. And then I had another lady who had an infection who died of it the year before and was also on by level. And like we, we literally, this is the part where I was like, we proned her, which doesn't happen. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with proning technique or why no. we do it. So proning is for um, severe arts and it's supposed to help with the um, oxygenation because um, when you have someone laying flat on your back, most of that tissue is being filled up in the back mm -hmm. space. So when you prone someone, the idea is to help pop open the alveoli in the back, uh, cause increased oxygenation. These people will actually oxygenate well and it's shown to improve mortality, but it's like you have to have a special bed because these people are hooked up. So we prone this person and literally blood everywhere. Oh wow. <laughs> it was like when we, she oxygenated better, like she was setting um, before we proned her, about 70%, 75% for 24 hours. Oh, man. Then we proned her and got, like, I don't know, 200 to 500 cc's of blood out. And then she started oxygenating about 96%. But she died um, en route to uh, U of M because oh. they pushed her out. We didn't push her out, but someone said that they wanted her to transfer to U of M. And uh, that ended up being a bad outcome for her as she coded in the helicopter. And they do have those beds. You remember that one? <laughs> I see Maria's face. Another tertiary plate lung, heart and lung center. Mm -hmm. they the beds, like, they will literally it. scrap yep. you and turn and you turn over. You upside down. Mm -hmm. The transporting with that, most transport vents do not have <laughs> bi level or a pair of yep. depending on who it is. So to get that that way, you have to kind of make it work, and it doesn't really. Oh, we know. We, we told them that this was not going to be <coughs> a good outcome, that he'd probably do well, but. That was not. That what do we know? <laughs> I guess we're, we're trying to learn our to learn ourselves because that's what we got to do. Uh, now, if here's the problem with staph uh, uh, pneumonias: is that you're going to have empyema commonly with these folks, uh, and also you can have the dangerous thing, which I think they were talking about, is a bronchopulmonary fistula that ends up with a pyopneumothorax. So it's a pocket with pus and air and bad stuff in it. 
back to the physiological course. So this is general, all right, this is what's happening. First step is going to be congestion of the alveoli that are failing because of too much edema and fluid in them, okay? Then you're going to have this thing called red hepatization, okay? Fun thing, I'll show you some cool pictures later. This is when you're going to have polymorphic RBCs, fibrin, edema, and just the organism building up in the, the air sacs. Then you're going to have something called gray hepatization, which is deposition of fibrin in the pleural surface. You're going to have phagocytes in there, um, and really it's just filled up with fibrin tissue, okay? Then you're going to have the resolution stage of a pneumonia. Neutrophils degenerate, you're going to have fibrin thread bacteria, you're going to have dead bacteria, digested stuff, um, and they're slowly getting removed by phagocytes, and it's regaining its own pink color once again, okay? What happens again? One more reminder, you're going to have several days of upper respiratory infection, maybe a little bit of rhinitis, and some cough, and fever. That's when you start thinking pneumonia. All right, viral pneumonia is typically going to have a little bit lower fever than bacterial, 100.9 to about 102. But you are going to have a little bit of kidney in these guys, okay? You're going to have some respiratory distress, subcostal muscles, accessory muscle use. But a severe infection, you're going to see very quickly cyanosis and respiratory fatigue. This is, again, the kiddo's problem. That's what we're the ones who get these a lot. They've got small airways that overreact to the viruses. Um, but then, when you, when you hear it on the chest, you're going to say weasels, wheezing and crackles. Because again, crackles is from fluid overload, wheezing because of the decreased pipes. And that's because of the fluid overload. This is red hepatization. So that's what your lungs look like when you have pneumonia. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Of course, these were gotten after deceased patients, so these guys didn't uh, have a good time of it. Uh, that's what normal lungs look like. That's a pneumonia one. You're having a bad day. I'm surprised that uh, a lot more hemoptysis doesn't show up in our clinical exam if we don't poke our eyes down deep enough. Now, this is gray hepatization. Okay, you're going to have fibrin deposition, you're going to have neutrophils in here. This is kind of after the main course of the illness. Okay, it's almost all the way to resolution, but not quite there yet. It can jump back in between, between red and gray depending on how rough you are. Bacterial pneumonia, you're going to have shaking chills, high fevers, greater than 102. You're going to have cough. You're going to have grunting even. You'll have some chest pain that's pleuritic. You're going to have super drowsiness. And again, this is probably due to the lack of oxygenation. You're going to have really high tachypneas. You're going to have a, uh, anxiety also. that You're going to feel like, hey, something's wrong. Okay, and that's what patients are going to come in for. Like, something's wrong. Please take care of it. That should be a sign, bacterial pneumonia. Okay, you're, depending on the stage, you're going to have some scattered crackles and, and, and ronkerous sounds over the area of the lung, especially when it's having consolidation or some other complication. We'll talk about those in a minute. You're going to have effusions. You're going to have empyemas, pyopneumothorax. You'll have dullness on percussion. We don't ever do percussion, but probably a skill that we should build up a little bit. Um, you're going to have a dim uh, diminished abdominal distension because you're going to have gastric dilation from swallowed air. It's still trying to suck it in, but it's going down too fast. So it's going down the wrong pipe. And that's what's happening. Uh, if you have a low bar, or lower lobe pneumonia, that will also cause some abdominal pain referral. It's irritating the diaphragm. Uh, liver may be enlarged. It appears so. Because again, once again, you're having downward pressing of that diaphragm, uh, or you're having hyperinflation of the lung. So this is something that can happen. Another thing you're going to have is neck rigidity without meningitis if you have an upper lobe pneumonia. All things to think about. Diagnosis is done with the chest x-ray. All right, and we'll go over the, this later. You don't do sputum cultures. You don't do blood cultures. It's chest x-ray, SpO2, clinical findings. That's the thing to choose on the exam. If they tell you do a sputum culture, that's wrong. Tell you do a blood culture, that's wrong. It's chest x-ray. That's the thing to do. But repeat chest x-ray is not required for proof of cure. Entirely clinical that they're getting better, they don't look as toxic, that's it. Okay, a couple reasons for that. One, chest x-ray lags from cure, so it doesn't actually, so it looks kind of rough, but they're clinically better, they're better, that's what it is. Um, the more importantly, we just have too many folks these days. Radiation can also lead to... Unless you're worried about problems. a post-obstructive pneumonia. That's right, that is right? right. But I think you have to do a CT scan in that case. Exactly. So, like, imaging would be required if you were concerned. 
Okay. Like this tone. All right. Uh, I did not put that in my algorithm. Hopefully they don't ask you that. <laughs> um, that thing about it though, oh, right? Sorry. <laughs> Plural effusions, you're going to have a low bar consolidations and again, high uh, fever, which is suggesting already the bacterial illness. So that's something you got to keep in mind. Uh, atypical pneumonia is due to chlamydia pneumonia or mycoplasma. They're dif difficult to distinguish from pneumococcal pneumonias by x-ray and other labs. So really it comes down to the course of the disease, your clinical acumen, and what you think you want to be covering for. For us, we usually just cover for it. You gotta give the, you gotta give bacterial pneumonia cause and then your atypical cause. You're gonna give them a macrolide, typically is a thermoisin. Uh, pneumococcal pneumonia though, if you have a, uh, you know, you want to clue in on it, you're gonna have higher white blood cell count, higher ESR, CRP, okay? So if you really, really want to get down the right antibiotic therapy, that's what you're going to do. Um, now, isolation from blood or pool fluid is a possible way to diagnose it. Not going to be the right answer on a test, okay? This is going to be if somebody's got some recurrent problem, they're really sick, you're trying to figure it out and things aren't working, you're going to do a bronchoscope, you're going to try to get some good sputum, um, and you're going to PSR it, you're going to culture it, you're going to do everything you can to it. There's another picture, again, the crappy uh, blowing it up. Uh, so this is the tallest building in the world, uh, the Burj Khalifa. As you can see, it is literally a spire in the middle of the desert. This is a real picture? It's a real picture. It's a uh, red. It looks like almost like someone like painted a, it. Like a weirdly, RSV. Weirdly, weirdly, when you handed it out, it <laughs> This is a real photograph. Again, a buddy of mine, a little, little you know, dust stormy day. So the background is a little off, but you know, this is what it's like in the desert. Uh, now this is the this is the important slide, but don't take a picture because I already got a handout for you guys. This is the treatments, okay? For treatment based on cause and clinical appearance of a child, you're gonna give them amoxicillin, 80 to 90 milligrams per kilogram. All right, per 24 hours, usually divided BID or TID. God knows if they're gonna ask you that, but <laughs> I put it on there. Oh my God, I would freak out. Uh, Cefuroxidin or Augmentin is going to be the next step up from that if it didn't work, okay? Or you're thinking, hey, they need something else. But if, they got, if they're school-age children, so five plus, they got walking pneumonia, you're thinking, uh, you're going to have a macrolide, which is a device, and same treatment as adults. Remember, five, five and above, they're adults when it's considered for what common illnesses they're going to have. Um, now, if they're hospitalized, though, you're going to go straight for Cefuroxidin. Uh, Cephotaxime or ceftriaxone. That's what we use here. Okay? You're hospitalized community acquired pneumonia, you're five and above, you're getting row seven. That's the deal. Uh, but if you think it's cephalococcal, it's empyema, the whole thing to give is vancomycin or clindamycin. I didn't know about the 15% uh, resistance rating in our area though, so clindamycin is not given in that case. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. Now, if they've got viral pneumonia, you're pretty sure, low-grade fever, not having too much respiratory distress, don't give them antibiotic. So and the only thing for here, just for any of these, we really should be looking at like the prevalence of bacteria and their sensitivities here in our area. Okay. Because it's different all across the globe, and we don't do that. There's like a... I think there's a website you can look at, and there's like the cards you can get. Within Cerner, there is an antibiogram. It exists. I forgot where to find it again, but if somebody would like to go down to uh, the nice folks over at Records, I'm sure they can tell us. Yeah. Okay, so it's there. It's always being updated by the latest data that comes in. So that's uh, a good thing, I suppose, that we should utilize that we do not. Okay. Uh, and again, this is the reason that we most of the time give antibiotic ther therapy for people with viral, definitely viral pneumonias. They're going to have, 30% of them are going to have bacterial underlying pneumonia that hasn't been picked up yet. Well, we do that because we don't want to miss a bacterial one. Like, it could have the coexisting, or we just want to, like, make sure that they don't get it. Exactly. The complications are rough, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, so, the deterioration in clinical statics, so you got to give them antibiotic, okay? If you, if, you, if you decided to not give them because you said it has viral, they start getting worse, you start it up. That's what you have to do. Uh, now, slowly revolving uh, uh, pneumonias, okay? So this is going to be complications. You think you got it, but not really. Start thinking about empyema. Start thinking about bacterial resistance, okay? Maybe that bug really figured it out. You know, for seven ain't doing the trick anymore. You got to do something else. But also, you got to start thinking non-bacterial etiologies. 
violence, but more importantly, aspiration of foreign bodies or food. Bronchial obstructions from some kind of a lesion, and again, mucus plugging, foreign bodies. Uh, Pre-existing diseases, all of that stuff. If they got pneumonia and it's not doing the, it's not getting better, you gotta open up the whole box. Big problems, pleural effusions, empyema, pericarditis can also happen. Bacteremia, hematologic spread, that's your usual sepsis. Uh, meningitis can also happen from pneumonia, evidently. And so can a funny thing called a suppurative arthritis and osteomyelitis of the rib cage. I'm sure that's not fun for anybody. Here we're going and taking a look at some of our pictures finally. Okay, this is a viral pneumonia. Diffuse, non clear chest x ray. Okay, this is also true in walking pneumonia. Here's a lobar pneumonia. This is the right upper lobe, as you can see. That's the shape of it up there. That's a problem. That's not what the lung's supposed to look like. And uh, somebody, in this case, might start having some of that neck stiffness because of the irritation of those muscles, uh, accessory muscles that are being used to try to compensate for this. You're gonna have bronchopneumonia. So this is gonna happen in the end of the bronchioles, okay? As you can see, it's a little some patchy infiltrates all the way throughout over there. Usually these guys not having a good time either. And then you're gonna have the staph pneumonia. This one is happening in the entire right side from the appearance. This is the normal chest x-ray. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you have over here. Now that is the end of the show, unfortunately. Do you guys have any questions or concerns? Why did you not talk about Pseudomonas pneumonia? You're right. I did not talk about Pseudomonas pneumonia. I have it in this. Okay. <laughs> so this is going to be with your healthcare acquired pneumonia. That's when you're worried about that. Uh, if everybody would start putting that around. So this should actually, this is a little crowded, but it should be bre broken up into two halves. You have your right half and then you have your left half. The right half is discussing when do you start thinking about you having pneumonia, okay? And what does it mean roughly? We'll start from the top right once everybody gets a sheet. You got fever and cough, you're thinking pneumonia. Then you get the first thing you do to everybody is you're gonna do the chest x-ray. It's negative, you think it's bronchitis, you can give them some PO treatment you, and you can do this at home. It's not a problem, all right? You think positive, you see one of those fancy pictures that we saw earlier, think they got a pneumonia, okay? Now, depending on the severity of it, we can do IV and then we can, we're can we gonna do this in the hospital, okay? And we'll talk about admission criteria a little bit later. Uh, now the fun ones are the cavitating lesions, okay? That's when you got an abscess, you gotta go to IV and you gotta keep them in the hospital. And then a little bit on the bottom left corner there, you're gonna have viral or flu symptoms. You're not really thinking it's uh, quite the bacterial pneumonia. This is off this chart then, you do nothing. You wait, watch and wait, essentially. Now going down is, this is gonna be what are the antibiotic therapies that we gotta give and what are the bugs that we're worried about, okay? So for community acquired pneumonia, and that's you've been 90 days away from some building, okay? Or less than 48 hours within a building. You're thinking strep pneumo, you're thinking M. cateralis, H. flu, Klebsiella, Staph aureus, Legionella. Now, they're gonna give you risk factors sometimes from where you're gonna think, hey, what bug is it? Okay, if they say what's the most common cause, it's strep pneumo. That's the most common bacterial pneumonia, period. If somebody's got COPD or large smoking history, you're thinking H flu, okay? Especially if they tell you they've never been vaccinated for it. That's the bug that you most likely are thinking they have. If they give you a history of ethanol abuse or other kind of dementia or one of those things, you're thinking Klebsiella. If they give you they had a post-viral syndrome, and now you're thinking it's a bacterial infection. What most commonly happens? Staph aureus. And then Legionella is gonna happen in immunocompromised or the exposures to it. And for those illnesses, you're gonna give third gen cephalosporin, that's rocephin for us, and also a macrolide azithromycin, or a respiratory fluoroquinolone, which is not done for us over here, but if you have to have that question on the exam, that's what you're gonna do. And, most, and hopefully they're gonna give you moxifloxacin, because that's what uh, is a respiratory fl fluoroquinolone. Then comes the HCAP, remember? That's hospital acquired, that they're in a wound care, a dialysis center, or they're on the vent. You're thinking Pseudomonas or MRSA, you're gonna give Piptazo, which is Zosin and Vancomycin. That's gonna be what you give for them. 
And then the last one is going to be the immunosuppressed groups. You're thinking TB, fungal, or uh, PCP, pneumocystis pneumonia. Okay. And for that one, you're going to get Bactrim and plus minus steroids, and we'll talk about when to give the steroids in a little bit. Now, there's, uh, if you guys have a couple of things to box off, there's a thing on the top in the middle called flu, okay? And that's going to be when do you think it's flu, and what are you going to do about it, okay? They're going to have fever, cough, and myalgias, body pains. It is going to feel like crap, okay? How are you going to diagnose it? You do a flu swab. And what will you give for it? We're going to give also.